All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Da Vinci Tree's online learning. Today is week eight, day number two. And for today's little glimpse at next year, we are talking about one of the main symbols of Da Vinci Tree. So as all of you know, Da Vinci Tree has a logo with the tree on top and a book opening on bottom. The Da Vinci Tree comes from Leonardo da Vinci's uh, amazing calculation that uh, he based off of the observation of trees. He discovered that a tree's branches never grow more than the sum total of the trunk at any given point. And there's actually a mathematical calculation and ratio that goes with it. And that is an amazing uh, example for all of us that teaches us that our education, our trunk, as people growing up, has a lot to do with how much we branch out in life. And so that's where the Da Vinci Tree name comes from, and that's why the logo is what it is for our school. Now, Da Vinci also has a second symbol, and we are going to talk about that second symbol today. This second symbol was announced at the end of the 2018-2019 school year by our then student council members, uh, uh, Riley, Mariah, and Thylesia. Let's go ahead and look at that. Um, so, the student council has been asked to introduce this beautiful piece of artwork behind me. This original piece of art was given to Da Vinci Tree by an anonymous donor. It is a one-of-a-kind, unique reimagining of a sculpture which stands in Queens, New York. In order for it to find its ultimate home in our school, it had to be transported from its previous home by track in March. It made a long journey that took it from Maryland to Arizona. Although everyone will be able to see that this is a beautiful piece of artwork, to truly understand it, we must discuss the history behind it. A World Fair or World Expo is a large international exhibition designed to showcase the achievements of nations. These exhibitions vary in character and are held in different parts of the world. The most recent International Exhibition Expo 2017 was held in Kazakhstan. Dubai has been selected to host the World Expo in the year 2020. The Unisphere was conceived and constructed as a symbol of the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair. The Unisphere is a giant aluminum globe with rings circling it that chart the flights of the first man-made spacecraft. The Unisphere, the theme of the 1964-1965 World's Fair was peace through understanding. The Unisphere represented the theme of global interdependence. The Unisphere was specifically commissioned to celebrate the beginning of the Space Age. It was dedicated to man's achievements on a shrinking globe in an expanding universe. The 1960s were a dramatic and scary time. Great leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and John F. Kennedy were murdered by evil men. People fighting racism were abused terribly by the public and in some cases even the police. America was fighting a cold war that split the world in two halves, each half afraid that the other would destroy them. It was during this time of desperation that the new sphere was created. The new sphere was a symbol of hope for the next generation. It represented a future without racism, a world without war where all nations unite using their best thinking to explore space. This is the reason why the Unisphere was donated to our school. Da Vinci Tree's diversity, inclusiveness, and faith in every student is the embodiment of the future that creators of the Unisphere imagined. With this history and art, this history and understanding of symbolism, we, the 2018-2019 Student Council, are pleased to present to you the newest symbol of our school, the Da Vinci Tree Unisphere! So that's where it was over a year ago, and here's where it is now in the Curie Building. We're gonna be moving it. We're just keeping it here at the moment uh, so we can remodel some of the other rooms uh, so you don't have to worry about it getting in the way if you're going to the restroom. But it will be ending up in the Curie Building for a permanent display at the school. As you can see, it is large and beautiful. 
this one-of-a-kind piece of art has a lot of meaning to it. It's not just, uh, uh, it's not just a pretty sculpture. Uh, it, it symbolizes what our school stands for. Well, let's go ahead and get to our Pledge of Allegiance for today. So wherever you are, please take a moment and stop. Stand up at attention. If you're wearing a hat like me, please take it off. Place your right hand over your heart and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, hey, well, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have a fantastic day of online learning today, and we'll see you again tomorrow. I think we are. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for week number eight, day number two of online learning. As you can see, I'm still wearing the same t-shirt as yesterday because I'm actually recording uh, day one and day two at the same time. But as promised, we do have different hats for every day. So uh, this next hat is a cowboy hat, but it's not a normal cowboy hat. This is in particular a, an Australian cowboy hat uh, made for Australian cattle wranglers uh, in the outback. And uh, I think I showed you guys a video about Australian cattle wranglers. Uh, Australian cowboys, unlike American cowboys, are famous for using helicopters. But uh, so this hat is just kind of a normal cowboy hat. It does have a koala pouch on the inside, which is, uh, like, I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's actually like a little, a little coin pouch or whatever on the inside. So you can, I don't know, hold something very tiny in there, I guess. And uh, this company that makes these advertised them as being super duper Australian. But if you look inside the hat, this hat was actually made in Oxford, Pennsylvania. So an American Australian ripoff, I suppose. So let me go ahead and pop it on. How do I look? Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and get to the lessons for today. So in life skills today, we're going to talk about something that is, sorry, this brim is bothering me. Oh, whatever, I'm just going to keep it. Uh, today we are talking about something that's not necessarily academic at all. We're going to talk about fitting into high school. Um, and most of you are headed to a high school where you don't know that many people. Uh, some of you are going to a completely new high school in a different part of town. Uh, I know that uh, like a couple of you, like uh, I think Mariah, you're going to a completely different school up north. Uh, Amber and Aiden, the only people you'll really know at the school you're going to is each other. You know, and so we're all kind of going our separate ways. Julio, you're going to a school across town. Uh, a couple of you are going to schools where you'll have friends like uh, Charles and Toby, but uh, a bunch of you. I don't know where you're going. Like, uh, like I'm not sure where you're going, Tegan or uh, Vienna. And uh, so, anyway, um, you know, so we're all going to different places, right? So let's talk about fitting in. Yeah, uh, when we get there. For current events and economics, we are taking a complete detour. I wanted to talk about something that wasn't academic, and it wasn't a depressing current event. So we are doing what I consider to be a super exciting current event. We're talking about the Artemis program. And if you don't know what that is, hold on to your pants, folks, because it is cool. Uh, so uh, wait for that in coming up in current events here in just a few minutes. Um, next up in history, we are covering the portion of history when America becomes an imperial power for the first time like ever. Uh, so in the late 1800s, like 18... 98 uh, into the early part of the ninth or the 20th century, so 1910-ish. Um, again, around the time of two of my favorite people, uh, William Taft and uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, and kind of like how they steered this country in a direction that we have never been able to completely give up. Uh, so we're going to begin talking about that today. In literature, as always, we are discussing Tom Sawyer, The Adventures Of. Uh, you were supposed to read Chapter 22 last night, so 23 is the homework for tonight. In science, we're going to continue with the book, uh, reading from 391 to 394. Uh, we are learning today about the wheel and the axle. Uh, 
So that, that'll be kind of cool. Uh, for group number uh, one, we don't have a new lesson today. It is simply doing another PDF with uh, um, the uh, probability, uh, um, the experimental probability, I should say, to be precise. And in group number two, uh, you are doing another practice, and then you have a, um, a manual to read. It's not a manual, it's like a PDF, uh, but it reviews all of the stuff that we've gone over with exponents. And so go ahead, and uh, there again, there is no lesson for either math class today. It's just a little bit of work. Okay, so uh, that is our agenda for the day. Let's go ahead and get started with our life skills. Okay, so to, for today's life skills, again, sticking with the idea of helping you to be prepared for high school, especially since we're not like in person, today we're going to talk about how do you fit in socially. So you might be thinking to yourself, Mr. Roll, you're going to give us an academic lesson on how to fit in socially. That is the nerdiest thing anyone has ever done in my presence. You are the nerdiest person ever. I am and I will. So uh, today we are talking again about uh, entering high school without knowing anyone and kind of finding your niche. Now you may think that this might be a silly subject to talk about, but it really isn't. Um, many of my students who have dropped out of high school dropped out largely because they didn't find the right group or the right place to fit in. So when we talk about academics, I'm very concerned about your academic future and how you perform academically in high school. But I am almost equally concerned that you find a place where you feel comfortable and you can fit in with uh, friends that hopefully you can take with you through college and for the rest of your life, perhaps. And so um, how do you fit in? when you don't know anyone and you're entering a new school as a freshman or maybe the one or two people that you know turn out not to really be a, sticking around with you, how, how do you work with that? How do you deal with that? So um, today I'm going to talk about three different places that most people who are entering high school without a preset group of friends, how, how those people cope and how they find friends to get along with. Um, so first let's talk about movies. You all have seen different high school movies with um, different, like, silly tropes. You know, you have the band kids, you have the jocks, you have the nerds, blah, blah, blah. And because it's, it's, it's this old trope that movie, that lazy movie directors and writers just pull out over and over again. Well, it's a trope because it's in part true. And so we're going to talk about three different areas where people often find a way to fit in. And I would encourage you to experiment with these three different areas. And so the first area that people find friends where they can fit in is sports. Now, I know a lot of you play a sport or you enjoy sports. And so if sports are something that you enjoy, that is a great area to find someone that you uh, that you like to hang out with, to make friends. It's a great place to build camaraderie because a lot of sports are done on teams and it's a really quick and easy way for you to get to know people and fit in. Um, in, in high school, pretty much all high schools offer the following sports, okay? And so of course you have the, the basic sports, basketball, football, and most high schools have soccer okay not all but most but a lot of high schools have sports that maybe you've never been introduced to before because they didn't have it at your previous school so uh, most schools have wrestling many schools out here have swim swim is a fantastic sport uh, pretty much all schools also have cheer uh, so if you're interested in being a, a cheerleader by the way guys my friends and I used to make fun of men who went out for cheer, but I realized my senior year that I was a fool to make fun of them. Uh, so if you are a guy who's interested in cheer, that is a very easy way to make a lot of friends who are not guys. So, you know, just throwing that out there. All right, uh, so, so we have all these different sports, and then we have different intramural sports. Uh, there are sports that are not necessarily played competitively. Um, but they are sports that uh, are done within the school. Uh, some sports that are like that, or they could be competitive, uh, are tennis. So some schools do tennis and they just do it within the school. They don't play other schools, but some schools play other schools. Racquetball. Uh, I don't know if I spelled that right. 
but there, there are there and there are more. Okay, so if you are athletic or you enjoy doing physical things, sports could be a very quick and easy way for you to find a really cool group of friends to hang out with. So I would encourage you to try out for sports. Oh, I forgot volleyball. Ah, it's so silly. Every high school has volleyball. And I'm sure there's a bunch of others that I forgot. But again, um, try out for a sport. Make some cool friends and spell racquetball correctly because I don't think I did. All right, so sports are the first thing that I'd recommend that you look into to uh, find a good group of friends. All right, the next main thing, and again, there are three. Sports is number one. Number two, we're going to talk about, um, oh shoot, what was it? Oh, music, music. So all high schools offer different fun and engaging music programs. And so um, even if you don't play an instrument, you can still be involved in a music program. And so the first and most obvious one is choir. Choir is a cool place to meet people. You know, it just is. Um, and so if you are musically inclined, choir may or may not be the thing for you. Um, but in addition to choir, uh, usually you have band, you have orchestra, Um, what am I forgetting? There's got to be more than this. Anyway, so there are at least those three, and in some schools, maybe more. Uh, and so band, choir, and orchestra are all things that you can get involved with, and they are an excellent way to meet people and make friends. Even if you don't normally think you're musically inclined, you should try and stretch yourself and maybe reach out there. Join the choir. Again, it couldn't hurt. And so music is the second way to make friends. Um, now, I don't think most schools offer this, but my high school actually had a classical guitar class, a classical and modern guitar, and then they had they, they did have many other class for other instruments. But I'm gonna put that in parentheses here because many of the classes to take for an instrument are not a good way to meet people and meet friends because like for instance at my high school they offered piano lessons and it was just you and the teacher uh, not a great way to connect with uh, peers your age yeah uh, but the guitar class however was an actual class where we all sat around in a circle each of us had a guitar and we all practiced it was cool and i did make some cool friends that way uh, so anyway music is the second thing that mr roll recommends you look into to find your niche and make some friends and then finally, I'm going to give this one the general overall term of activities. And I'll tell you what I mean. Activities and clubs. Activities and clubs. It's not just clubs, though. Let's start talking about a few things. So first up is what we normally just call STUCO. STUCO. And it's short for Student Council. Now, we try to have student council at Da Vinci Tree, but we're such a small school that uh, Stuco is basically responsible for doing some stuff for kids, uh, for the students like the dances and whatnot. Uh, but student council in a high school is uh, quite a bit more of a responsibility. Um, and so student council uh, in the high school um, is charged with doing a whole number of things, everything from helping to keep campus clean, deciding on student policy, things like that. But you have to run for Stuco, and it's like running for a political office. And so you make a lot of friends, you make a few enemies. Uh, but again, running for student council is a really good way to get integrated and meet a tight group of people. Um, then we have all kinds of different clubs. Um, we have, uh, so Stuco's one, I would say religious clubs. Religious clubs. Uh, so, and we have interest clubs. So for me, uh, I was always raised Christian, and so we had uh, different Christian clubs that we were uh, involved with. I became the president of a Christian club my senior year in high school, and so that was a way I met a lot of people and a lot of people knew me. Uh, you have different clubs for different interests. You have, um, you have your D&D, &D, if you're a little bit on the nerdier end like I am. Uh, most most high schools have the anime and manga club. Again, more up my alley. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you, again, nerdy stuff. Audiovisual. 
I don't think anyone will be surprised to learn that the big nerd, Mr. Roll, was also the president of the Audiovisual Club. I can say we made it cool all day long. That doesn't mean you'll ever believe me. Um, let's see here. Again, there's all sorts of clubs. Many schools have something called the Kite Flyers Guild. And it's a bunch of cheesy uh, guys and girls who take flying kites very seriously, and it is awesome. Uh, they are a really fun group of people. Uh, and so there's all kinds of really fun and sometimes ridiculous clubs that you can join that I definitely recommend you look into because it creates that strong sense of community. Um, there's other activities that you can be a part of. Uh, the school newspaper. Many schools still have a school newspaper. Uh, that is a really cool activity to be a part of. The school yearbook committee is uh, something you can participate in and make friends. Um, let me think, I gotta, I gotta know others. I remember when I was thinking about this, um, I can't think of them off the top of my head. But if you are the kind of person who is worried about making friends in high school, look into the different activities and clubs that the school offers and say to yourself that you're going to try a few of them, maybe that you normally wouldn't because you're listening to me right now. Again, these activities and clubs are really great ways to meet people and connect with them outside of a classroom. When you're sitting in a classroom, most of the time you're just kind of sitting there and you're like, ah, when will this be over? I'm nervous that that cute guy or girl's looking at me. Uh, what is that person wearing? Oh my goodness. Oh no, the teacher's calling on me. Uh, what were they saying? I forgot. I wasn't paying attention. And so normally when you're in class, all these things are going through your head and you're not always making meaningful connections with people. But these activities and clubs and the music and the sports allow you <laughs> excuse me, to connect with other people in meaningful ways and actually make good friends. And so again, if you are one of the people who is uh, going to a school where you don't know anyone and you're afraid of, of not being able to connect with people and make good friends right away, I suggest looking into these three things, sports, music, and then your activities and clubs. Okay, I hope that was helpful for some of you, and uh, even if it wasn't, if you find yourself in a place one day where you're like, I really don't have any good friends in high school, this really stinks. Go ahead and try out these three things. See what you can join, see what you can become a part of. All right, let's jump into our current events. All right, it's time for current events. Pretend you're trying to make a slam dunk on a basketball hoop. Is it easier to make the slam dunk just by running and jumping normally ah, and hoping you'll make it in? Or is it easier running and jumping on a trampoline and hoping you'll make it in? Well, obviously, it's easier jumping off a trampoline to try to get up there and make your slam dunk because the trampoline propels you upward. Now, in the most basic sense, that is why it is important for human beings to work and live on the moon. What? Mr. Roll, what are you talking about? Well, you see, kids, the moon is our closest uh, celestial neighbor. It is right next door to us. Now, the moon is still a far journey. Uh, going as fast as human beings can travel at this moment in time, the moon is still three days away. So, again, it's a three-day car trip with no pit stops going several thousand miles an hour. So the moon is still pretty far away. When you look up in the sky and you see it, it is, it is off in the distance because this thing is huge. But the moon, being our nearest celestial neighbor, has almost no gravity. It's very low gravity for us. And it's because it's so close to us, it's a great place for us to learn how to build things and live in outer space. It's, it's, um, it, it's almost like if you had a neighbor who uh, gave you their house and their house was really dumpy and you could learn how to remodel a house by experimenting on their home before growing up and having to buy a house of your own and, and, and do it on. The moon is kind of like our experimental place for us to figure out how everything works. And then when we finally do figure out how everything works, the moon is the logical place for us to start launching programs to other places. 
So one day, people like Elon Musk and uh, 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 others would very much like to go to the planet Mars. And the moon is the best place to make spaceships to actually go to Mars. Because if you think about it, if you could launch a spaceship off the moon, you wouldn't need these giant rockets that we have now. You just need little rockets, because it's easy to get off the moon. What's really hard to get off of is the Earth. And so, and so NASA has come up with a very awesome plan for us to build permanent moon bases. Now, unfortunately, in the past, America had some problems with racism and sexism. And so a long time ago, when we last landed astronauts on the moon, the astronauts were always Caucasian, and they were always men. Not a great look in today's uh, kind of diversified world that we live in. And so NASA has plans to launch uh, uh, people, new astronauts into space, including women, which is great, and minorities. Who would have thunk, right? And so, uh, and so the next phase of American moon exploration begins in the year 2024. Again, right around the corner, you will be in high school when this happens. And this is called Project Artemis. And it is a plan to go to the moon and stay on the moon and build a permanent human colony and a permanent human presence on the moon. And I am tickled just thinking that this is happening during my lifetime. Kids, during my life and your life, no human being has set foot on the moon. And if all goes well, in the next four years, you will never live in a time when a human isn't currently on the moon. And so Mr. Roll is super excited for this, and we do have a short video for you to watch that is linked in the, uh, in the notes for today, and it is narrated by none other than, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Van, Van Tron from uh, the Star Wars movies. She, she is uh, one of the characters in the Star Wars movies, and so they got like the perfect person to narrate this video as well. Okay, so I hope you like the video. Uh, go ahead and click on it. It is a really fun animation that explains the Artemis program and how it works. So, it's time for history, and I'm going to open today by saying things have been a little more stressful than usual with everything from COVID-19. And so I've decided to do some, oh, some of my own personal self-care in a way that I haven't done in a long time, and I've gotten back into playing some video games. Now, in particular, the game that I've chosen is Sid Meier's uh, Civ VI, Civilization VI. It came out, I think, three or four years ago, and it's a really fun game about building up your own civilization and then conquering other civilizations through cultural conquering, religious conquering, or just straight up attacking them with your army. It's a lot of fun. And so uh, the reason why I bring that up is we are entering a phase of American history where America becomes imperialistic for the first time, really. Uh, we are uh, um, in this period of time in the late 1800s, early 1900s, America for the first time begins to really stretch its arms and take over control of lands in far-flung places. Now, up to this point in time, Americans were on one coast and they were worried about moving to the other coast. We started in the east and we moved to the west and we started flooding everything in between with farms and cities and things like that. And that was the manifest destiny that we've talked about. Now, we've talked about the good and the bad that came from manifest destiny and there was a lot of both. Um, but Americans really stuck to our continent. We stuck to North America. The only significant expansion of American territory outside of the 48 states that go all the way from like the uh, from the East Coast where the 13 colonies began to the West Coast where we get California, Oregon, and Washington, the only significant expansion outside of that was Lincoln's Secretary of State. Remember we talked about uh, all of Lincoln's cabinet, uh, Seward, Chase, Bates, and, and all of those cool guys? So, Secretary of State William Seward bought the state of Alaska from Russia, and Alaska was the only significant territorial gain that the United States had outside of the main continental U.S., uh, because Alaska was right up there, close to the Arctic Circle up there, uh, off the coast of Russia, and, and connected to Canada. And so Alaska was the only thing that America owned that was substantial and not directly connected with the rest of the country. And that was, um, that was I think, in the, what, between the 1860s and 1870s, sometime in there. So 
Um, so in the late 1800s, though, America fights uh, the Spanish-American War. And the Spanish-American War is actually a war for independence for Cuba. And so Americans, like, uh, like William McKinley, who was the president, and again, one of my favorite people, Theodore Roosevelt, who uh, was working in the Navy uh, Department, and he beefed up the Navy, so it was really, like, freaking strong, raw Navy. And then he quit the Navy so that he could become a soldier, but instead of becoming a normal soldier, he almost started his own private army called the Rough Riders, and he kind of joined them to the United States Army, and then he went charging into Cuba with his own army that he paid for. <laughs> he was nuts, okay? And, and so they went into Cuba, and the Spanish were just like, oh my god, there's so many Americans here. And, and we greatly outnumbered the Spanish. And so the Spanish-American War was over in like six days, okay? Uh, we went in there, and we came, we saw, we won. Boom, it was done, right? And again, uh, a big, big uh, pat on the back to Teddy Roosevelt for that. Um, and so, Teddy Roosevelt, one of his less fortunate qualities, he was a super manly man. He loved hunting. He loved ranching. Uh, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of jokes about he was like the Chuck Norris of his time. I don't know if you kids remember a few years ago, there were Chuck Norris memes everywhere about how he's like a superhero in the flesh. But Teddy Roosevelt was like the Chuck Norris of like the 1890s, where he was just like the super most manliest man of all time. And uh, uh, in fact, he still represents America in my video game, Civilization VI. He's still like the guy, right? Um, and, so, <clears throat> and so we kicked Spanish butt in Cuba. And what that did was it led to a chain of events where we took over a bunch of Spanish stuff. Okay, so we took over Cuba, uh, we took over Guam, which I think was owned by Cuba at the time, I don't remember exactly. We took over Puerto Rico. Uh, Guam and Puerto Rico, by the way, we never let those go. We took over the entire Philippines, okay? If you have ever, uh, like, like if you listen to um, uh, like Filipino music, or uh, Black Eyed Peas have songs about being Filipino, okay? The entire nation of the Philippines, America took it over. So America owned, uh, for a brief moment in time, we took over Cuba, uh, we had uh, Guam, we had Puerto Rico, we had, um, we had the Philippines, and then, unrelated to the Spanish, so completely outside of the Spanish, we took over the island of Hawaii, and we literally stole it from Queen Kamehameha. So if you kids watch Dragon Ball Z, uh, Goku's famous move was Kamehameha, Kamehameha, right? That is actually the name of the queen of Hawaii that we basically kicked out and, and when we took over Hawaii, okay? So we, we overthrew Queen Kamehameha and took over Hawaii at that same time. Uh, and then we took over, uh, shortly after that, we took over the Virgin Islands. Um, that was kind of, um, if I remember correctly, um, oh, no, uh, then we took over the Virgin Islands and we took over Samoa right after that. And so th there's, um, there's American Samoa and normal Samoa and that was kind of a mistake of history because we were fighting the Germans for all of Samoa because Germany, I think, they, they, they stuck a claim to Samoa. And so uh, we were fighting them, but it was only one boat. It was one American boat and one German boat, if I remember. And, and the American boat and the German boat were fighting, and we thought we were going to win, but then a big storm came. And, and during the storm, it was so bad that both boats just went home or something like that. And so half of Samoa that the Americans took over remains American Samoa to this day, like in the year 2020. And the other half that the German boat was on, uh, they just became their own country. And we were like, we were just too busy to ever go back and, and get the rest. And the people in American Samoa, they liked being American Samoa. So they're just like, hey, what the heck? We're American Samoa now. Cool. Um, and so anyway, during this period of time, we started taking over a lot of stuff. Um, it had good uh, implications and bad implications. So let's talk about the good stuff. So good thing number one, we took over Cuba, threw the Spanish out, and then we almost immediately gave Cuba back to the people. We let Cuba decide for itself uh, what government they wanted and this and that. And so we gave Cuba back to the Cuban people very quickly. We liberated them, case closed, problem solved. Excellent work. That was great. Um, it didn't turn out so well in the end for us because Cuba got taken over by a dictator that hated us. 
So, you know, more on that later, but that's okay. Um, then next, uh, we kept Guam, we kept Samoa, uh, we, kept, uh, we kept Puerto Rico, all right? So we kept a bunch of it, all right? We didn't give it all back. Uh, and then we took over the Philippines. And so the, the first kind of like, uh, the first person who really was in charge, almost as like the prime minister of the Philippines after we kicked out the Spanish, was a guy named uh, uh, William Howard Taft. And Taft later became the president of the United States, but first he was basically the prime minister of the Philippines for many years. And so the bad thing about us owning the Philippines is that there was a really bloody war. After we beat the Spanish, we had to fight the Filipino people to take them over, which maybe we should have just let them govern themselves. Now, the thinking was a little racist, but also innocent. The idea was America takes over the Philippines, teaches the Filipino people how to run a democracy, and then we let them go. And when the Filipino people understand how democracy works and they have a stable government and a stable economy, then we're going to give it back to them. And so we took over the Philippines in like the early 1900s. It was a terrible, very bloody war. In fact, America set up concentration camps. Oof, that's a bad look, right? We set up concentration camps. We threw over 300,000 Filipinos in concentration camps. Some, something close to 10,000 Filipinos actually died in the concentration camps that America set up. This is before World War II and the Holocaust, by the way. Uh, you know, and so maybe Germany got the idea from someone else, you know. Um, and so, so that was bad. That was really bad. Um, but after the war and after everything settled down, when Taft took over as basically, again, I forget what his title was, but he was like the prime minister of the Philippines. Taft never wanted to be in control. Taft wanted to be a judge. He was concerned about fairness and the rule of law, and he loved the Filipino people. He was not a racist man who thought of them as second-class people. He thought everybody was equal under the law. He was a devout Christian. He believed that God made everybody equal. And so Taft began building the building blocks of a stable government in the Philippines. And eventually Taft had to leave the Philippines because he got tapped on the shoulder by Teddy Roosevelt to be, I think, Secretary of State. I need to go back and double check that. Uh, and so when, when Teddy Roosevelt called upon him to serve in the White House, Taft had to leave. And then later after Teddy Roosevelt, Taft was the second in line. He became president uh, after Teddy Roosevelt, so he never went back and, uh, and ruled the Philippines again. Uh, but during his rule, there was peace and prosperity, and he was working out a lot of the problems that they had. And so eventually, uh, America actually made good on its promise. And, and uh, 30, 30 some odd years after America took over the Philippines, we actually agreed as a society that the Philippine people or the Filipino people had come far enough where they were ready to rule themselves in a democracy. And America actually voted to let them become an independent country, and they were super thrilled. Uh, unfortunately, World War II happened right then, and the Japanese took them over. Ouch. But America went back to the Philippines again. The, for the second time in 50 years, the first time we went to the Philippines, we went there to take to take them over after the Spanish let them go. And the second time we went in, we went in to save them from the Japanese, and we did. And so in World War II, after uh, the Japanese uh, were kicked out because they lost World War II, then the Filipino people finally took their rightful place as an independent country. And so the story has a happy ending. The intention of Americans to teach the Filipino people how to run a country that is a functional democracy actually worked. Um, the Philippines still has problems to this day, um, but that's okay. So do we. Everyone has problems. No one's perfect. And, and again, it actually worked. The Philippine, Filipino people have a, uh, a representative democracy. And so anyway, I'm going to be quiet now and let you guys uh, uh, read through the thing. Um, but basically, I think, I think I told you more stories than they even cover, but I hope you paid some attention. I know I'm long-winded and boring. All right, let's go ahead and jump into literature. Oh, 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 oh. So, I'm so sorry. I know I talk a lot, but I talk a lot about the Philippines and the Philippine-American War. Uh, because So the Philippine-American War, um, there was a guy who led the Philippine independence movement against America, and his name was Emilio Aguinaldo. And Emilio Aguinaldo was a hero to the Filipino people. 
And the reason why I like to talk about the Philippines so much, and I know a lot about the Philippines, is because Emilio Aguinaldo's great-grandson was a guy named Ronald, and he was one of my best friends in high school. <laughs> and so, uh, in fact, it was because of him, or it was because of me, that Ronald almost failed AP history, because I got the teacher really mad at us when we were doing a group project. So uh, anyway, I apologize for talking so much about the Philippines, but it is kind of cool when you actually know somebody who is like related to somebody who changed history in a really big way. So anyway, now let's go on to literature. All right, uh, week eight, day number two. And so uh, we uh, should have read chapter 22 yesterday, so let's go ahead and review some of that. And there are times in this book where I actually laugh out loud as I'm reading it, and if I remember, chapter 22 was one of them. So Tom wants to join this group. Uh, it's like, um, uh, it's like a, kind of like a quasi-church religious thing, but like not really. It's called the uh, Cadets of uh, Temperance. And so the Cadets of Temperance um, are this group that promise like good morals and things like that. But really, Tom only wants to join them because they, they get to wear a cool uniform, and he wants to wear that uniform. He wants the red sash. And so he joins the cadets, but he's having a really hard time because he has to promise not to smoke or swear or do all those other things. But he really, this is terrible, but he really wants to stay a cadet until the justice of the peace dies because then he can go to the funeral and wear the outfit at the funeral and show off to everyone at the funeral as to how good he looks. And then, and then the justice of the peace, who is very sick, gets better. And when, when the justice of the peace gets better, he gets frustrated and he quits. And then that same day that he quits, the justice of the peace suddenly dies. And so, uh, and so that really bums him out that he quit. So a man has died, but he doesn't care. He's, he's just upset that he won't be able to go to the funeral wearing, you know, wearing the, the, the suit. And so that was kind of fun. Um, now you think, what else? Oh, his, his kind of like, like on and off again girlfriend, Becky, she goes away uh, to a different city with her, with her parents. Um, I think what else happens? He goes to like a couple of like street parades and other things like that. Um, hmm, I'm trying to remember. Um... Oh yeah, that's right. He gets he gets really sick, and so um, uh, um, he he gets the measles. So we don't really get measles measles anymore at all because we have vaccines now. Like all of you who come to school, you're supposed to get the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella. But measles was a really like bad disease back in the day, and sometimes it could even kill you. But it definitely kept you in bed for weeks, sometimes like a month or more. And so and so Tom got the measles. And he was stuck in bed for like a week or two. And, um, and when, he, when he got out of bed, finally, he met up with his friends. And his friends, uh, I guess a, a, a preacher or something like that had come through town. And his friends all became uh, super religious while he was in bed uh, with the measles. And, and, uh, and he was worried that he didn't fit in because he didn't want to be super religious. Like, he quit the Temperance League for a reason. He wasn't a temperance cadet or whatever, uh, because he couldn't do it. And so he was kind of nervous about fitting in. And then, uh, and then there was like a, a storm, and he thought that because everyone in the town had become really religious and good except for him, he thought that the storm was God's way of, of like punishing him. And then sure enough, he got the measles again. The measles came back. And he was again in bed with the measles for several weeks, which could happen. Like, you could get the measles more than once, absolutely. And so, and he was in bed for a couple weeks after that because of the measles. And so that kind of reinforced his thinking. He was like, oh, the storm is because I'm bad. Oh, and now I'm getting measles because I'm a sinner. And then, and then when he finally recovers completely from the measles, he gets out of bed. And he goes back to his friends that became, like, super religious. And then he finds out that two or three weeks later, they're not religious at all. They're back to their same sinful selves. So, and that's the end of the chapter. And I really think that's Mark Twain's way of saying that things happen. Um, they just do. They don't have a reason. You know, Tom got the measles twice. There was a storm. Uh, people became religious and then gave it up. Things just happen. And um, just you can't always prescribe a rhyme or reason to why things happen. 
All right, that's it for today's literature chapter. Um, today, week number two, you need to read chapter 23 as your homework, and we'll talk about it tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so last week we learned about the inclined plane, and uh, what was the other one that we learned about? Inclined plane and the wedge. All right, and then yesterday we learned about screws, which was an inclined plane wrapped around a cylinder, and we learned about the lever, which is kind of like a straight rod on a fulcrum. And so today we are going to learn about the three kinds of levers, and then we're moving on to a new kind of machine. So let's go ahead and continue. So there's three classes of levers. The three classes of levers differ in the positions of the fulcrum, input force, and output force. Note the locations of the labels in each example. So this one is a first class lever. The output force is uh, uh, right here, very close to the fulcrum. So yesterday, what we were talking about with the spoon opening the paint can would be considered a first class lever because the output force and the fulcrum are really close to each other and the input force is far away. Let's go ahead and read. If the distance from the fulcrum to the input force is greater than the distance from the fulcrum to the output force, these levers multiply force. Otherwise, they multiply distance. Note that this kind of lever also changes the direction of the input force. Other examples include scissors, pliers, and seesaws. And in fact, kids, if you ever used the, the hammer the, on the back of the hammer, so you have the hammer, bang, 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 and on the back of the hammer there's a claw, and you use the claw to, to pull out nails from the wall. It's called, I think, a claw hammer, right? A claw hammer is another example of a first-class lever. All right, so let's talk about second class levers. And here you can see the second class lever with the woman and the wheelbarrow, right? Second class levers. These levers always multiply force. They do not, however, change the direction of the input force. Other examples include doors, nutcrackers, and bottle openers. So you see the fulcrum is out on the front there, and the output force and the input force are both going in the same direction. But because the fulcrum is in front, the, uh, the input force can be less, and it magnifies the output force. And so the woman there with the, with the wheelbarrow, she probably wouldn't want to be holding all of those flower pots at the same time. But because she has the wheelbarrow, uh, the wheelbarrow is amplifying her, her input force in, in its output force. And so uh, it is uh, making it very easy for her to transport all of those at one time. Okay, and now finally let's talk about third class levers. And so with a third class lever, it's kind of different because the fulcrum is still at the base, and then the input force is in the middle and it's greater, and the output force is at the top and it's actually less. So we're magnifying distance in this case. All right, so these levers mul uh, multiply distance, but do not change the direction of the input force. Other examples include fishing poles, shovels, and baseball bats. All right, so you see there, so the input force, the old man is holding it at the top, so that's his fulcrum. The input force is in the middle, and the output force has a lower output force. But the thing about it is that rake or that broom, okay, depending on what you're using, that rake or that broom is covering a really wide area. And so as the rake or the broom is going back and forth, you're multiplying the distance that it's covering, even though you're putting in more effort or more force yeah, in the middle and there's less force at the end, the end is swinging a much further distance. So you're multiplying distance and decreasing the output force. So again, we have three kinds of levers. Class 1, which is like a hammer claw. Class 2, which is like a wheelbarrow. And class 3, which is like a rake or a broom. All right, let's keep on moving here. Wheel and axle. Oh, I thought we were doing pulleys. That's tomorrow. I'm sorry. Wheel and axle. Could you insert a screw into a piece of wood using nothing more than your fingers? You would find it almost impossible. But with the screwdriver, you can turn the screw with ease. A screwdriver makes use of a simple machine known as a wheel and axle. A wheel and axle 
is a simple machine made of two circular or cylindrical objects that are fastened together and that rotate about a common axis. I think I spelled Axel wrong in the syllabus. I apologize. I actually had a student named Axel a few years ago that spelled it A-X-E-L, and I think that's why I made that mistake. Um, all right, the object with the larger diameter is called the wheel, and the object with the smaller diameter is called the axle. In a screwdriver, the handle is <clears throat> is the wheel, and the shaft is the axle. Oh, any pictures? Come on, guys. Oh, here we go. Okay, so I guess we have to... Uh, is this all? Okay, let's read through it, and then, then, then we'll talk about the picture and which one is the wheel and which one is the axle. Yeah? Every time you turn a doorknob, you're using a wheel and an axle. The, the knob is the wheel, and the shaft is the axle. The water wheel of a mill, the steering wheel of a car, and the handle of an egg beater are also examples of a wheel and axle. Advantages of wheel and axle. How does a wheel and axle make work easier? You apply an input force to turn the wheel, which is larger than the axle. As a result, the axle rotates and exerts an output force to something such as a screw. The wheel and axle multiplies your force, but you must exert your force over a longer distance. In this case, a circular distance. So, I, I'm, I think I'm right when I say if you had a really big handle on your screwdriver, you could put a lot more force on the screw because you're, you're doing it over a greater distance. Okay, and so looking at the actual picture here, okay, so the input force, so the handle right here is the wheel, and then the stem right here with the flathead is your axle. And so this is wheel and axle. And so right here we have the same idea with the back of this flatboat ship. So the input force is happening on the axle, and it's turning the wheel on the back of the ship. Wheel and axle. Let's go ahead and read the history part of it now. Science and history and engineering marvels. Some machines have been used to create some of the most beautiful and useful structures in the world. In uh, 2550 BCE, the Great Pyramid in Giza, Egypt, uh, workers used wooden wedges to cut 2.3 million blocks of stone to build the pyramid. At the quarry, the wedges were driven into cracks in the rock. The rock split into pieces. Workers hauled the massive blocks up inclined planes to the tops of the pyramid walls. And in fact, I, we talked in class in, um, in my sixth grade social studies last year. This year, Miss Kimmy taught it. But last year, we talked about how they used inclined planes to get all of the blocks in place. Now, every now and again, you'll see something on like Netflix or Hulu where some Yahoo foolish person claims that the pyramids and the Great Wall of China were built by aliens. And there's always people who believe in like the earth is flat and stuff like that that agree but kids in reality the pyramids were very much built by people and uh and and we know that because when we do x-ray scans of the pyramids we can actually see the inclined planes the ramps that they use to get the giant blocks up into the places where they belonged in the pyramids and on the inside of the blocks, the, the gangs of people or the teams of people, they actually had cool nicknames that they gave themselves, like the Khufu Boys or like the Sons of Ra and things like that. And they would have their own little graffiti symbols that they would etch into the stone before they'd put the stone into place. And it was just kind of their kind of fun way of counting their stones because this was a lot of work you can imagine but they were very proud of all of their stones that they put into place and now many thousands of years later scientists with x-rays when they scan the rock they can actually see the uh, the etching of the different people and the different teams that put the rocks into place along with the ramps that they used which is super duper cool and again they did all of this with no modern technology this just using these simple machines of the wedge and the inclined plane they were able to make these beautiful pyramids that even to this day we haven't been able to replicate fully yeah okay uh, the theater at Epidaurus Greece Instead of ramps, the Greeks relied on a crane powered by a pulley to lift the stone blocks to build this theater. That was amazing. Again, no modern tech. Shoo. 
The crane was also used to lower actors to the stage during performances. So the Greeks were super serious about their performances. One of the cool things about these uh, Greek uh, uh, theaters, too, is that they tried as much as they could to utilize uh, uh, science and acoustics because they didn't have speakers back then. And one of these itty-bitty people who were performing at the bottom, they would have to be yelling. But the Greeks realized that sound kind of naturally goes up and out. And so they would build the seats up, 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 up like that to be above the actors and so that they could hear from way up high. Now today, because we have speakers and amplifiers and stuff like that, when you go to a rock and roll show, oftentimes the stage is up really high and everybody's down below so that the, 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 uh, the musician or whatever, uh, they can look down on everyone and everyone can see them because they're up high. But that's because we have modern technology to amplify the sound. Before they had that, it was actually better for them to be below you since sound travels upwards. Yeah. All right, so the advantage of the wheel and axle. How does a wheel and axle make work easier? You apply an input force to turn the wheel, which is larger than the axle. As a result, the axle rotates and exerts an output force to turn something such as a screw. The wheel and axle multiplies your force, but you must exert your force over a longer distance. In this case, a circular distance. All right, and um, let's see here. You can calculate the ideal mechanical advantage of a wheel and axis using the radius of the wheel and the radius of the axle. Uh, each radius is the distance from the outside to the common center of the wheel and axle. Ideal mechanical advantage is the radius of the wheel divided by the radius of the axle. For a screwdriver, a typical ideal mechanical advantage would be 1.5 centimeters, the radius of the wheel, and 0 0.3 centimeters, <clears throat> which would give you a mechanical advantage of 5. And so, again, the handle is 5 times uh, larger than the stem. Okay, A variation of the wheel and axle. What would happen if the input force you applied to the axle uh, was applied to the axle rather than the wheel? For the riverboat on figure 17, the force of the engine is applied to the axle of the large paddle wheel. The large paddle wheel in turn pushes against the water. In this case, the input force is exerted over a short distance, while the output force is exerted over a long distance. So when the input force is applied to the axle, a wheel and axle multiplies distance. This means that the ideal mechanical advantage of the paddle wheel is less than one. So in other words, kids, this paddle wheel on this riverboat um, the axle has a ton of force on it, and the paddle itself, as it's going around, has a lot less force, but it's over a much longer distance. So if you wanted to stop a paddle wheel that was in progress, where would it be easiest to stop the paddle wheel if you were just going to grab it and use Hulk hands? If you were one of the Avengers and you wanted to use super strength to stop the paddle wheel, would it be easier to grab the axle and try and stop it, or would it be easier to grab the paddle and try to stop it? If you guessed that it was easier to grab the paddle, you would be correct. Because again, the paddle has less force, it's over a longer distance. And so it'd be easier to stop it at the paddle than it would be at the axle. Okay, um, that is it for the reading tonight. And I was going to read that extra history part, but it appears I'm getting the spinning wheel of death. So let's cut it short there and let's move on to math. Have a have a good uh, math class and I hope you learn something about science. All right, group number one for today, we are doing more probability, uh, more experimental probability. Um, if you are following along from yesterday, this comes directly out of your, whoops, sorry, the fan blew something over. This comes directly out of your book and uh, it is just our second PDF uh, set for your work. So go ahead and download the PDF answer the questions, and send them into Mr. Barbero. Questions are pretty straightforward, but if you have any questions, as always, reach out to Mr. Barbero and myself, and uh, whoever can help you out first will get to you. All right, so go ahead and finish that up, and have a great rest of your day, guys. Take care.
Alrighty, group number two, you know the drill from yesterday. We're just doing that practice uh, that you were doing yesterday, but it's the next one. And then we also are going to read that final, uh, like the little reading thing that they have on Khan Academy to complete this section. So that's it. Go ahead and get those two things done, uh, and you are good to go. Uh, have a great rest of your day, guys. Take care.